Shalom. My name is Adam, and I welcome you to the parable of the vineyard. Every day, Yahuwah is waking up a remnant, a group of people who are coming out of deceptions, realizing our walk is to consist of faith and obedience to His righteous commands. Each week, we read through and examine a portion of the Torah, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide, teach, and open our eyes and ears to the wondrous matters out of His law. Join us as we seek to be refined by His Word, preparing ourselves for the return of our King of Kings, being faithful and obedient, walking in His way, truth, and life. Shabbat Shalom and welcome back brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream of our Torah portion reading. My name is Adam, your host, and I welcome you. This is week 14, Va'era, which is which covers Exodus 6, verse 2 through 9.35. Last week was a large portion. We covered uh, the first six chapters, or the first five chapters actually. But it was a longer one because we went through all the history of, well, you know, because... At the end of Genesis 50 to Exodus chapter 1, we have um, Joseph ruling in Egypt, and then everybody's in slavery, and you're like, how did that happen? So last week, we spent a lot of time um, looking at uh, supporting books like Yashar, the Targums, uh, and Jubilees, fitting the, the pieces together to see exactly how all that went down, uh, looking at a lot of the parallels of Egypt then, spiritual Egypt now, um, and we're gonna we're gonna have we're gonna see a lot of things in this week's Torah portion relating to the book of Revelation. It's the story all same story all over again. The book of Ecclesiastes, verse one, chapter one, verse nine, says, um, "There's nothing new under the sun. What's happened before will happen again. There's nothing new." And we see that in the book of Re Revelation. But uh, before we get started, uh, let's get into some prayer and let's Abba, let's ask Abba to bless this study. Heavenly Father, Yahweh Most High, we come before you and say Shabbat Shalom to you. Thank you for this weekly appointment with you, Father, that you say is a sign between us and you. Father, we just thank you for sending your Son, Messiah, who should the Word, which is a lamp to our feet, our, our King of Kings, our Messiah, Father, that through his blood and his offering, that when we believe on him, we are reconciled to you, Father, and we thank you for drawing us out of this world and calling us to even believe on your true son father we know that none of us can even do that unless you draw us first we thank you we bless you we ask you to open our eyes and ears during this study that we may hear see and obey father and we just ask you to guide our steps day by day as we walk this path and let us not go to the left or to the right this please bless us with your ruach hakodesh and understanding father in yahushua's mighty name amen and hallelujah yahuwah so before we get started, though, let's wake y'all up with some shofar. So that's right. Praise him with the sound of the shofar. I know we do probably do a lot of praise in our, our prayers and our thanksgiving to him. But are we, we blowing the shofar or making making no, joyful noises to him? Whew, it's a blessing to do it, brothers and sisters. You'll notice here we're at 2 Esdras 15. In case you're new, 2 Esdras was included in the 1611 KJV, the 1599 Geneva, the 1560 Geneva, and other Bibles uh, under the Apocrypha section. This was uh, in, considered canon until the mid-1800s. Um, nevertheless, what I want to read for you here is you're going to see that in a prophetic sense, it's the same story all over again. Let's get started. Let's get our blue light blocking glasses on. Protect those eyes and let's go. To Ezra's 15, 10 through 19. Behold, my people is led like a flock to the slaughter. And I think I read this passage last week. I may read it during the entire book of Exodus during our Torah portions because I want to continue to reinforce that it's the same story over, all over again. And there's a reason why I want to enforce it. And I'll discuss it a little bit later. I will not allow them to live any longer in the land of Egypt. 
But I will bring them out with a mighty hand and with an uplifted arm and will smite Egypt with plagues as before and will destroy all its land. So we know that his chosen people aren't literally just all living in the land of Egypt again. This is spiritual Egypt. I think America specifically is spiritual Egypt, but then again, the whole world is like spiritual Egypt. The whole world is like Babylon. Even though there is literally mystery Babylon and it's one place, the whole world earth is like literally daughters of babylon so it's like the same thing nevertheless he's telling you here it the same thing happen is going to happen again people are led to to the like a flock to the slaughter they're living in egypt in captivity maybe this current day captivity is a little different than before maybe not chains and whips but maybe a different kind of captivity so verse 12, let egypt mourn and its foundations for the plague of chastisement and punishment that yahweh will bring upon it just like we're going to read tonight. Tonight's all about the plagues. And we're going to notice the plagues of uh, Exodus are going to be very much like the plagues of Revelation. Let the farmers that till the ground mourn because their seed shall fail and their trees shall be ruined by blight and hail and a terrible tempest storm. Alas for the world and for those who live in it. This reminds me of Revelation where it's like, woe to the inhabitants, inhabitants of the earth, right? You know, uh, rejoice, ye heavens, and you that dwell in them, in them, but woe unto the habitants of the earth, for the devil has come down unto you, knowing he has but a short time. Oh, and also, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the voice of the uh, trumpets which are yet to sound, or something like that. So, similar stuff here, right here. Alas, woe for the world and for those who live in it, for the sword and misery draw near them, and nation shall rise up to fight against nation with swords in their hands. So, can we just talk about what's going on right now, right? It's getting a little spicy again out there. The heat's getting turned on with the uh, possibility of war. I know this has been going on forever, but I'm just saying. It's something I'm always keeping an eye on, an eye on. Nothing to worry about. There's nothing to worry about, even if, like, you know, people are like, oh, Russia's going to invade this country and blah, 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 blah. Listen, you know, or China or whatever. Listen, Let's take a look at the story of Jeremiah and Baruch and the other righteous people that were walking in Yah's ways and trying to share with people the truth. What happened? Nebuchadnezzar's army came in and be like, hey, where's Jeremiah? Where is he? Hey, you're good, man. Hey, you want to come with us to Babylon? You can. You want to stay here in, Israel, in, in Jerusalem? You can. You're on the good list. Who's to say these armies would have a list from Yah? It happened before. Why can't it happen again? I'm not encouraging that because I like living in somewhat peace in this land i'm just saying though there's nothing to fear is all i'm saying there's nothing to fear even if the worst thing possible happened there's nothing to fear let's uh verse 16 for there shall be unrest among men growing strong against one another they shall in their might have no respect for their king or the chief of their leaders right is this a time in history now where people can't stand politicians and the kings or the the, the um you know presidents or uh prime ministers you know they're just like uproars for a man will desire to go into a city and shall not be able. For because of their pride, cities shall be in confusion, the houses shall be destroyed, and people shall be afraid. A man shall have no pity upon his neighbors, but shall make an assault upon their houses with the sword and plunder their goods because of hunger and for bread and because of great tribulation. This is the great tribulation. You want to escape that? I believe there is an escape. Just a few verses down, same book, same chapter, verses 24 through 27, actually. Woe to those who sin and do not observe my commandments. There's that, there it is. Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, says Yahuwah. I will not spare them. Depart, you faithless children. Always reminds me of um, Matthew 7, where it's like, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, right? You workers of lawlessness. <clears throat> so being faithless is equated to lawless. So depart, you faithless children. Do not pollute my sanctuary. For Yahweh knows all who transgress against him. Therefore, he will hand them over to death and slaughter. For now, calamities have come upon the whole earth. There's one time that tribulation encompasses the whole earth at one time. And you shall remain in them. For Elohim will not deliver you because you have sinned against him. So by implication, this is telling us that those that do keep his commandments will be delivered and will not remain in the calamities, will not remain in the tribulation. So... Just like the Israelites were protected in from the plagues which we're about to see, so I believe his true remnant will be as well. Okay, now, Torah portion. So, Exodus chapter 6, verse 1. Well, at the Torah portion starts at verse 2, but we might as well just start at verse 1. 
And this is the Sefer version, and we're going to be cross-referencing with uh, the book of Yashar and the uh, the Targums, the Aramaic. So, then Yahweh said unto Moshe, Now shall you see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And Yahweh Elohim spoke unto Moshe and said unto him, I am Yahuwah. And I appeared unto El Abraham, unto El Yitzchak, and to El Yaakov by El Shaddai. But by my name Yahuwah was I not known to them. And this is a this is an interesting topic because I've seen uh, people talk about this both ways. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, our dearly parted, departed uh, brother Alan Horvath posed a question, and it's a pretty fascinating question. Is if you put a question mark here, it kind of says the opposite because this basically straight up says, um, you know, Abraham, Isaac, you know, Jacob. They didn't know my name Yahuwah. They knew me by, uh, you know, El. Uh, Elohim and, and El Shaddai, which is the Almighty, but they didn't know me by the name of Yahuwah. But it says, if you had a question mark here, think about this, but by my name Yahuwah, was I not known to them? Like, wasn't I not known to them? It's an interesting, fascinating topic. Um, with careful consideration, I, I I think this says what it says. Looking at the Septuagint, looking at the Targums, they all kind of clearly state that his exact name wasn't known. Now, if you go back to like Genesis, you'll see well right there it's Yod Hey Vav Hey. Well, let's let's consider that this the entire Torah was written by Moshe after his name was revealed. So just consider it. It's not a point of contention. Um, you know whether they knew the name or not. I don't know. People would say, now, on the other hand, and the reason I know Alan kind of defended this position is because people would say, well, ugh, Abraham didn't know his name, so we don't have to either. But that's not a really good argument because it's like, it's it reminds me of the argument like, well, the thief on the cross, you know, didn't keep Sabbath and didn't keep the feast days and he was in, he was in paradise that night with Messiah. Well, but, you know, and then the the reply back is, well, we're not thieves on crosses. We have time to do Shabbat and feast days. He didn't. He went, you know. So likewise, we're not Abraham, we're not Isaac, and we're not Jacob. We're living in a time where his name has been revealed. So why would we not want to embrace it? So anyways, just something to consider. And as far as the name... Um, if you go to the homepage of Parable of the Vineyard, you scroll down, there's a bunch of uh, playlists. There's one video, we, we talk a lot about the importance of the name. It's right here, it's called the Antichrist Revealed Documentary. Um, it's under this uh, playlist here, Mark of the Beast, Mystery Babylon, Antichrist. Um, it, it goes over the importance of the name. Now, we don't make a contention in this ministry about how to pronounce it. Um, we really don't. You know, I, I think the the effort is where, where it's at. I think there's power in calling upon his name rather than uh, calling upon titles. Um, you know, just something to consider. Something to consider. I've found a lot of blessing with in prayers and just uh, song, you know, calling him by name, uh, praising him by name and song rather than title. Um, I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's like, think about this. Think about, uh, for those of you that are married, or any one of you that have ever had a significant other, if you wrote a song about them, or let's say they, they wrote a song about you, and the whole song, it's like, it's like, oh, husband, husband, or oh, wife, 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 or, you know, whatever. or if it's like, you know, or like, you know, oh, my Stephanie, or oh, my Adam, you know, it's like, I think it's like a little more intimate with the name. I don't know. Maybe it's a bad, maybe this is a bad point. I don't know. But it's just something to consider. It's like we're supposed to have a relationship with him. And we've all had relationships. Maybe some of you youngsters out there that are watching, maybe you haven't yet. Take your time. There's no rush. Um, but those of you that have, like, it's like, you know what a, what a relationship is like. It's, it's, it's supposed to be deep. It's supposed to be intimate. You're supposed to have these deep conversations. And it's supposed to have this connection. And if you just use titles for each other the whole time, it's like, how intimate is that? Um, you know, I think there's something intimate about knowing his name and calling upon his name. Again, no contention about how to pronounce it. I'm sure half the people on here don't agree with me on how to pronounce it, but you're probably still here because we don't argue about it, right? Um, so, I don't know, just some thoughts. Just some thoughts. Let's keep going. If I do stuff like this, this will be, take forever. So, let's keep going. Um, all right, so... <clears throat> Exodus 6, 
4. And I have also established my covenant with, with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groanings of the children of Yashrael, whom the Mitzrayim keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am Yahuwah, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Mitzrayim, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take to you for me a people, and will be to you an Elohim. And you shall know that I am Yahweh Lahaikim, which brings you out from under the burdens of the Mitzrayim. And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Yitzchak, and to Jacob, and will give it to you for a heritage. I am Yahweh. We're literally waiting for the same exact promise uh, as the, the children of Israel in Egypt right now. Again, the bondage in our time is more spiritual and financial. You know, financial bondage, spiritual bondage, um, mental bondage, um, bondage via food and chemicals and with a spring in the air, all kinds of stuff. It's just different. It's just totally different, but it's, it's, it's a similarly is a type of bondage. Um, a couple of verses I just want to read on my heart regarding this, as far as bondage, freedom, you know, we'll be in total freedom, even though I'm not going to lie, I'm not gonna be a spoiled brat. You know, uh, this country has a lot of freedoms that we don't have throughout the, the world and throughout history and how people were treated. We have a pretty good, now, is it total freedom? No, it's not. It really isn't. When we be living in total freedom, when we be living under the care and direction of Yahuwah directly, living in Torah completely. We don't live in a nation ruled by Torah. Uh, Deuteronomy 4, 1 through 10. And now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and the ordinances which I teach you, and do them that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which Yahweh your Elohim of your fathers gives you. This is the same promise for us today. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your Elohim which I command you. Your eyes have seen what Yahweh did at Baal Peor, for Yahweh your Elohim destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to Yahweh your Elohim are all alive this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and ordinances as Yahweh my Elohim commanded me, that you should do them in the land which you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who, when they hear of all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has an Elohim that's so near to it as Yahuwah our Elohim is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and ordinances so righteous as all this law, this Torah, which I set before you this day? And it truly is. His Torah is amazing when you actually look at it and, and play it out. Most of us grew up in a time where there were fences put around it. Those of you grew, who grew up in Christianity, oh, the, nobody, you can't do the law. Nobody can do the law. Only only Jesus can do the law. You can't do it. And so he did it so you don't have to do it. And so you're like, oh, cool. Easy. But what we learn is a life away from Torah is hard. Ouch. There's a lot of ouchies involved. Well, same thing growing up in Judaism. It's like, I, I just I always think about this. We go into synagogue and it's like, everything's all beautiful. You got this beautiful Torah scroll right in center. This beautiful oak, stained oak and glossy case. And you got all this gold fringy stuff all on the Torah. But you don't even open it and read it. You open the Talmud and the Mishnah and the whatever else and read all that. Right? Putting it, it's a different kind of fence, fence around it. You, read, you spend time reading books about the Torah then rather than reading the Torah itself. And so it was amazing. <clears throat> about a month ago, I was, a lot of you know, I was in Southern California, got a chance to minister uh, or just help out with my father, my earthly father, who also grew up Jewish, but um, through a lot of the hypocrisies was like, yeah, right, this isn't it. And he became atheist for years. But over the last year and a half, I've been going back and forth visiting him sharing the truth and this last time really got some time to talk about the scriptures with him and he's like he's like Adam what you're doing is like uh, it's like Christianity and it's like Judaism but it's neither but it's both and I'm like mm-hmm mm-hmm right it's like that old saying um, Christianity is all all Messiah no law Judaism is all law but not really and no Messiah but it's a little bit of both and it's not either one kind of thing. Anyways, praise God, my father was coming around. 
thank you all for some of your prayers out there. I know I've been discussing him with you all, and I know some of you guys have been praying. I've been hearing your emails or seeing your emails and stuff. So thank you. It's working because he's when I left. <laughs> When I left, last time I left, the, his last words to me were, Adam, I've made a pact. Did you say a pact? Maybe he, you know, maybe he said I made a promise or a decision. He said I made a decision to follow Elohim like you follow Elohim. And he calls, he will call him Yahushua. Um, he says it's not proper. He says it's Yahushua. So I'm like, okay, Yahushua. Sounds good. <laughs> Praise Yah. Anyways, uh, I don't know why I went on this rabbit trail. Okay, verse 9. Only take heed and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. How on the day that you stood before Yahuwah, your Elohim, at Horeb, Yahuwah said to me, Gather the people to me, that I may hear them, th I'm sorry, that I may let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live upon the earth and that they may teach their children so. Praise Yah. Let's look at the heart of David. Psalm 19, 7 through 11. The Torah of Yahweh is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of Yah is sure, is sure, making wise the simple. We want to talk about a parable about wise and foolish virgins. The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahuwah is clean, enduring forever. The ordinances of Yahuwah are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who wants great reward? I do. Let's keep it. Let's do it. Talking about freedom, right? coming out of Egypt. A big part of coming out of Egypt is coming back to his Torah. James one twenty five. But he who looks on the perfect law, the Torah of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearers that forgets, but a doer that acts, he shall be blessed in his doing. The Torah is freedom. To Ezra 1, 33 through 37 Thus says El Shaddai, Your house is desolate. I will drive you out as the wind drives straw. And your sons will have no children because with you they have neglected my commandment and have done what is evil in my sight. This is, of course, the parable of the vineyard, talking about unfruitful Israel being kicked out of the, uh, the vineyard. I will give your houses or give your vineyard to a people that will come without having heard of me will believe me. Isaiah 65, I saw to them that knew me not. Those to whom I have shown no signs will do what I have commanded. They have seen no prophets. Yet will recall their former state, repentance. I call to witness the gratitude of the people that it is to come, whose children rejoice with gladness, though they do not see me with bodily eyes, yet with the Ruach, they will believe the things I have said. Praise Yah. Okay. Okay. Sorry, uh, that was a longer detour than I thought. So, similar promises. All right, let's keep going. Uh, Exodus 6 9. And Moshe spoke. In, uh, sp I'm sorry. And Moshe spoke so unto the children of Yisrael, but they hearkened not to Moshe for anguish of the ruach and for cruel bondage. How many of us have tried to share this awesome truth of coming back to Yah's ways, and people just aren't hearing? Maybe for a different reason. Back then, they were like, you know, whipped and enslaved, and and just working, you know, all day long, and they just, you know, they were just tired, and they just couldn't hear. Maybe people are tired for a different reason, tired in their spirit and their ruach from all this spiritual persecution. Maybe it's because they're glued to the television watching Satan's prophets, you know, prophesying their stuff, and their spirit is just in anguish, and they don't even know it. They're in bondage and don't even know it. Exodus 6.10 And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, Go in, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Mitzrayim, and he let the children of Yashorel go out of his land. And Moshe spoke before Yahuwah, saying, Behold, the children of Yashrael have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? And Yahuwah, and so can you imagine if Yah spoke to any of us, being like, Hey, go speak to uh, President so-and-so. I'd be like, why would he listen to me? I can't even get my mom to listen to me, you know? I can't even get my, you know, my co-workers to listen to me. You know what I mean? Just imagine, just put yourself in Moses' shoes for a second. Like, What? And Yahweh spoke unto El Moshe and unto El Aharon and gave them a charge unto the children of Yashrael and unto Pharaoh, king of Mitzrayim, to bring the children of Yashrael out of the land of Mitzrayim. 
All right, uh, verse 14, now the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. These be the heads of their father's houses, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Yashrael, Hanuk and Palu, Chetzron and Kormai. These be the families of Reuben. And the sons of Shimon, Yemuel and Yamin and Ochad and Yakin and Sochar and Shaul, the son of the Canaanite woman. These are the families of Shimon. And these are the, fam the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And the years of the life of Levi were 137 years. The sons of Gershon, Livni, and Shimei, and according to their families. And the sons of Kohath, Amram, Yitzhar, Hebron, and Uziel. And the years of the life of Kohath were 130 and three years. The sons of Merari, Machli, and Mushai, or Machlai, and Mushai. These are the families of Levi, according to their generations. And Amram took him Yochebed, his father's his father's sister to be his woman, and she bore him Ahron and Moshe, and the years of life of Amram were 137 years. The sons of Yitzchar, Korach, and Nepheg, and Zikrai, and the sons of Uziel, Mishael, and Elishaphan, and Chithrai. And Ahron took him Elishava, daughter of Amenadab, sister of Nachshon, to be his woman. And this is a, um, we went over this actually in detail in uh, the book, a Hebrew book, Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, and um, the first part when we talk about Yahusha's lineage. And, uh, anyways, we went over this that Aharon, the great high priest, the first great high priest, married a daughter of Judah, right? Daughter of Amminadab. Amminadab is you look in the same, the genealogy. Um, this is uh, he married a, a woman of Judah. So interesting. The very first union was the two, in those days, the two greater tribes, Levi and Judah, they connected together. Interesting. And she bore Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. So Eleazar, who took over the priesthood after Aaron died, was Levi and Judah together. Kind of interesting. And the sons of Korach, Asir, Elkanah, and av e safah avi safaf avi saf these are the families of Korchai. and eliezer ahron's son took him one of the daughters of putiel to be his woman and she bore him phinehas these are the heads of the fathers of the leviim according to their families these are that Ahron and Moshe, to whom Yahweh said, Bring out the children of Yashrael from the land of Mitzrayim, according to their armies. These are they which spoke to Pharaoh, king of Mitzrayim, to bring out the children of Yashrael from Mitzrayim. These are that Moshe and Ahron. And it came to pass, on the day when Yahweh spoke unto Moshe in the land of Mitzrayim, that Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, I am Yahuwah. Speak unto Pharaoh, king of Mitzrayim, that all I say unto you, and Moshe said before Yahuwah, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How shall Pharaoh hearken unto me? All right, so that's the end of chapter 6. Uh, just There's one verse in the Targum I want to take a look at. Um, again, thanks to Josh for making this available. Uh, Targum 6, verse 16. And these are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their race, Gershon and Kohath and Merari, and the years of life of Levi, 137 years. He lived to see Moshe and Aharon, the deliverers of Israel, probably at a really young age, probably saw his babies and then passed, but it says that he still still saw them. So pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. All right, and I think that's it for the Targums on chapter six, as far as things that kind of stood out. Um, do we have anything on Yashar in this chapter? Nope, nothing on Yashar in this one. Okay, so here we go. Now um, Moshe and Aharon go before Pharaoh. So here we go. Exodus 7, 1. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, See, I have made you an Elohim to Pharaoh, and Aharon your brother shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aharon your brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Yashrael out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Mitzrayim. So I wanted to, we could have, we could have brought this up last week. Um, we can bring it up here at verse three. We can bring it up all through this chapter, um, or all through this Torah portion. There's several times it says that Yahuwah hardens Pharaoh's heart. And some people would be like, kind of a question. I'd be like, well, how fair is that to, to Pharaoh that Yahuwah hardened his heart? So it's like he didn't even have a choice, right, to let the children of Israel go. That's not quite exactly how it works. Let's look, take a look at, um, 
I mean, do you get what I'm saying? Some people will actually, and Paul actually mentions this in, I think, Romans, you know, um, how can you, you know, some would say, you know, he hardened Pharaoh's heart, you know, and Paul would be like, who are you to question Elohim? But I think there's even more to it, not saying that I have more wisdom than Paul, I wouldn't dare say that, but I'm, what I'm saying is, I think there's more to the story that it's, it wasn't like Yah was like, it wasn't like Pharaoh was just going to let them go, and Yah was like, no, 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 I'm not going to let you let them go. Um, at least from how I understand it, I could be wrong. But if we take a look at what Proverbs 16 says, it says, The plans of the heart belong to a person, but the answer of the tongue is from Yahuwah. All the ways of a person are clean in his own sight, right? The plans of his heart, but Yahuwah examines the motives. Commit your works unto Yahuwah, and your plans will be established. So it's like, the plans of the heart of Pharaoh belong to him. And all Yahuwah really did was harden what was already in Pharaoh's heart, which was, you know, to not let them go, to... Um, and so he just hardened his already evil heart and intentions of not letting them go, if that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. So we can't give any... We can't charge Yah with any wrongdoing. Well, of course, he's Yah. I mean, how could we do anything like that? But I'm just saying... <clears throat> Some people would be like, huh, that's kind of unfair. Well, not really, because that was Pharaoh's already evil heart that Yahweh just hardened even more. Okay, uh, let's keep going. But Pharaoh, uh, Exodus 7 4, but Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Mitzrayim and bring forth my armies and my people, the children of Yashrael, out of the land of Mitzrayim by great judgments. And the Mitzrayim shall know that I am Yahuwah when I stretch forth my hand upon Mitzrayim and bring out the children of Yashrael from among them. So, oops, so, all right, the Mitzrayim shall know that I am Yahuwah. Well, there's going to be a day. What the whole world gonna know? Is gonna know that he's Yahuwah. Uh, oops, I didn't. So this is Ezekiel thirty-seven. I meant to pick a specific verse. Uh, or is it? Uh, yeah, here we go. So, anyways, this is Ezekiel thirty-seven. It's all about the resurrection. Um, and it's all about the the regathering and the the coming of the of Messiah and the and the first resurrection and whatnot and then bringing the people back into the land, New Jerusalem, and then verse twenty eight. Then the nations will know that I Yahweh do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in the midst of them. Praise Yah! Right in verse before that, my dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Hallelujah! Waiting for that day, are we not? Uh, all right. So let's keep going. Verse 6 of chapter 7. And Moshe and Aharon did as Yahuwah commanded them, so did they. And Moshe was fourscore years old, and Aharon fourscore and three years old. So Moses was 80, Aaron was 83, when they spoke unto Pharaoh. And Yahuwah spoke unto El Moshe and unto El Aharon, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then shall you shall say unto El Aharon, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Uh, yeah. And Moshe and Aharon went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as Yahuwah had commanded. And Aharon cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Mitzrayim. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aharon's rod swallowed up their rods, and he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them as Yahuwah had said. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Get you in unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goes out unto the water, and ye shall stand by the river's brink against he come. And the rod which was turned to a serpent shall you take in your hand. And ye shall say unto him, Yahuwah Lohai of the Ivrim, the Hebrews, has sent me unto you, saying, Let my people go. Let my people go. Or if the, the Louis Armstrong one... <clears throat> Let my people go. Sorry, it's a great song. You should look it up. That they may serve me in the wilderness, and behold, hitherto you would not hear. Thus says Yahuwah, and this you shall know that I am Yahuwah. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, 
and the river shall stink, and the midstream shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, Say unto Aharon, Take your rod, and stretch your hand upon the waters of the Mitzrayim, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Mitzrayim, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. And Moshe and Aharon did so, as Yahweh commanded. And he lifted up the rod, and smote the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river returned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died and the river stank and the Mitzrayim could not drink of the water of the river and there was blood throughout all the land of Mitzrayim let's go let's take a look at uh, some stuff in Revelation something similar stuff not exact Revelation 8 8 through 11 the second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood a third of the living creatures died in the sea and a third of the ships were destroyed the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and fountains of water. The name of the star is Wormwood, which is bitterness. And a third of the waters became Wormwood, and the many, many men died of the water because it was made bitter. Kind of something similar here that the river stank, right? It was bitter or it was stinky. Just some, something similar. And uh, something I just want to share with you. I wish there was a better picture. Like This is a great chart, but... It's really terrible um, pixels or um, resolution. But you'll see here, a lot of plagues, they echo in the book of Revelation. Water turned to blood. Um, actually, oh, I missed that one. So let's look at Revelation 11.6. And, oh, see, see, look, this came in handy. Revelation 11.6 and 16 through 4. So, Revelation 11, 6, they had power, this is the two witnesses, had power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of the prophesying, that they have power over the waters to turn them into blood, and to smite the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Similar stuff, right, that was going on here. Revelation 3, uh, 16, 3 through 4, the second angel poured his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a dead man, and every living thing that died was in the sea. And the third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. So very similar things to what we've seen in Exodus. But here, going back here, you'll see that almost everything has a direct correlation, except for the gnats, the flies. Although we do have the locusts coming out of the pit. Oh, yeah, well, that's the locusts we hear. But we don't have the gnats, the flies, and the pestilence or the livestock disease. However, you know, uh, if there is, you know, true drought and famine, the livestock's going to die as well. So, But everything else, the boils, the hail and lightning, the locusts, the darkness, um, the death of the firstborn, uh, all that is, you'll see in Exodus, is relates to in Revelation. So pretty cool stuff. Um, oh, interesting. How about that? I'm not saying say it's cool, you know, the plagues are cool, but um, it's interesting. So let's take a look at Yashar 79, 38 through chapter 80, verse 5. And the serpent of Aharon's rod lifted up its head and opened its mouth to swallow the rods of the magicians. And Balaam, the magician, answered and said, This thing has been from the days of old, that a serpent should swallow its fellow, and that living things devour each other. Right? So he's like, yeah, it's nothing special. Now therefore, restore it to a rod as it were at first, and we will also restore our rods as they were at first. And if thy rod shall swallow our rods, then we shall know that the spirit of Elohim is in you. And if not, you are only an artificer like unto ourselves. Like you're only a magician like us. And Aharon hastened and stretched forth his hand and caught hold of the serpent's tail and became a rod in his hand. And the sorcerers did the like with their rods, and they got hold in each man the tail of his serpent, and they became rods as at first. And when they restored two rods, the rod of Aharon swallowed up their rods. And when the king saw this thing, he ordered the book of the records that related to the kings of Egypt to be brought. And they brought the book of the records, the chronicles of the kings of Egypt, in which all the idols of Egypt were inscribed, for they thought of finding therein the name of Yahuwah, but they found it not. Kind of interesting, kind of correlates to what we were saying earlier, that his name had not been revealed yet. Because if it was revealed to Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, especially Abraham, and Yitzhak, especially Abraham when he was down in Egypt, and they took Sarah and all the plagues, and you don't think Abraham would have been like Yahuwah. They would have been written down somewhere, but it wasn't. 
And Pharaoh said to Moshe and Aharon, Behold, I have not found the name of your Elohim written in this book, and his name I know not. And the counselors and the wise men answered the king. Now, this is it's pretty interesting here. This is Pharaoh's counselors and wise men answered the king. We have heard that the Elohim of the Hebrews is a son of the wise, the son of ancient kings. Now, if we took the plural off there, it would literally be correct because the Elohim of the Hebrews, Messiah, who is here interacting with us uh, since day one, he is the son of the wise, of the Elohim of Elohim, the only true Elohim, our father. Messiah said the same words. Is Messiah Elohim? Yes. Is he the Elohim, the father? No, he even said himself. He said the father is greater than I. I go into my father. My doctrine is not my own. It's my father's. He who sent me. But anyways, since we know it was Messiah that was down here interacting with the patriarchs, it's interesting that the, the wise men of Pharaoh says, we have heard that the Elohim of the Hebrews is a son of the wise. Now, those of us that have read the um, writings of Abraham, which is not to be confused with the book of Abraham that's included in the Mormon book. It's a totally different book. People put the two together. They're two, two, two totally different books. The writings of Abraham is not in the, the, the Book of Mormon. But the writings of Abraham, it clearly stated that Abraham um, preached the son of Elohim. And he preached in Egypt and other places. So that was recorded. Totally legitimizes this book, the writings of Abraham. Anyway, just it's interesting. So I don't mean to harp on this point too much, but listen. The counselors and the wise men answer the king. We have heard that the Elohim of the Hebrews is a son of the wise, the son of ancient kings. Now, they lived in a, a multiple God uh, thing here, so they probably just, you know, just out of that. But if it literally this didn't have plural, it would literally be correct. The son of the ancient king, Yahuwah, the father. Interesting point. And Pharaoh turned to Moses and Aharon and said to them, I know not Yahuwah whom you have declared, neither will I send his people. And they answered and said to the king, Yahuwah Elohim of Elohim is his name. And he proclaimed his name over us from the days of our ancestors and sent us, saying, Go to Pharaoh and say unto them, Send my people that they may serve me. Now therefore send us that we may take a journey for, the, for three days into the wilderness and there may sacrifice to him. For from the days of our going down to Egypt, he has not taken from our hands either burnt offering, oblation, or sacrifice. And if you will not send us, his anger will be kindled against you, and he will smite Egypt with the plague or with a sword. And Pharaoh said to them, Tell me now his power and his might. And they said to him, He created the heaven and the earth, the seas, and all their fishes. He formed the light, created darkness, caused rain upon the earth, and watered it. He made the herbage and the grass to sprout. He created man and beast and the animals of the forest, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, and by his mouth they live and die. Surely he created you in your mother's womb and put you in the breath of life, put into you the breath of life. And he reared you and placed upon you the royal throne of Egypt, and he will take thy breath and thy soul from you and will return, return you to the ground whence you were taken. And the anger of the king was kindled at their words, and he said to them, But who amongst all the Elohim of nations can do this? My river is my own, and I have made it for myself. Right, just boastful and proud. That's his heart. And Elohim just simply hardened his already evil heart. And he drove them from him, and he ordered the labor upon Israel to be more severe than it was yesterday and before. And Moshe and Aharon went out from the king's presence, and they saw the children of Israel in an evil condition for the taskmasters had made their labor exceedingly heavy. And Moses returned to Yahuwah and said, Why have you ill-treated your people? For since I came to speak to Pharaoh, what you did send me for, he has exceedingly ill-used the children of Israel. And Yahuwah said to Moshe, Behold, you will see with an outstretched hand and heavy plagues Pharaoh will, Pharaoh will send the children of Israel from his hand. And Moshe and Aharon dwelt amongst their brethren, the children of Israel in Egypt. And as for the children of Israel, the Egyptians embittered their lives with heavy work which they imposed upon them. Chapter 80. At the end of two years, Yahuwah again sent Moshe and Fa uh, Moses to Pharaoh to bring forth the children of Israel and to send them out of the land of Egypt. And Moses went and came to the house of Pharaoh, and he spoke to him the words of Yahuwah who had sent him. But Pharaoh would not hearken to the voice of Yahuwah. And Elohim roused his might in Egypt upon Pharaoh and his subjects. And Elohim smote Pharaoh and his people with very great and sore plagues. And Yahuwah sent by the hand of Aharon and turned all the waters of Egypt into blood with all their streams and rivers. And when an Egyptian came to drink and draw water, he looked into his pitcher and behold, all the water was turned into blood. And when he came to drink from his cup, the water in the cup became blood. And when woman 
A woman kneaded her dough and cooked her victuals. They appear, the appearance was turned to that of blood. Yucky. All right. Uh, now back to Exodus 7, uh, 7, verse 22. And the magicians of the Mitzrayim did so with their enchantments. So they also were able to turn water into blood. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them as Yahuwah had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither did he set his heart to this also. And all the Mitzrayim dug around about the river for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. And seven days were fulfilled, and after that Yahuwah had smitten the river. All right, uh, let's see a couple of the things of note. Targums, we're going to read verses 9 through 11. And when Pharaoh talks with you, saying, Give us a miracle, you shall say to Aharon, Take that rod and cast it down before Pharaoh, and it shall become a basilisk serpent, more like a dragon. For all the inhabitants of the earth shall hear the voice of the shriek of Mitzrayim when I shatter them, as all the creatures heard the shriek of the serpent when he made naked at when he was made naked at the beginning. And Moshe and Aharon went into Pharaoh and did as Yahuwah had commanded. And Aharon threw down the rod before the sight of Pharaoh and before the sight of his servants, and it became a basilisk. But Pharaoh called the 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 Chachems, the magicians, and they also Janus and Jambres, magicians of Mitzrayim, did the same by their burnings of divination. So, um, basilisk serpent. More like a dragon without his wings, right? Ugh. Nasty looking thing. Well, I'm not going to call it nasty. I mean, if this is a creation of, yeah, I'm not going to call it. It's just like, oof, I wouldn't want to face that thing. All right. Okay, let's keep going. So now we're at chapter 8. And we're going to read verses 1 through 15. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, Go unto Pharaoh, and saying to him, Thus says Yahuwah, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your borders with frogs. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house, and into your bedchamber, and upon your bed, and into the house of your servants, and upon your people, and in your ovens, and in your kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on you and your people, and upon all your servants. Yuck. And Yahweh spoke unto El Moshe, saying to El Aharon, Stretch forth your hand with your rod over the streams, and over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause the frogs to come up upon the land of Mitzrayim. And Aharon stretched out his hand over the waters of Mitzrayim, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Mitzrayim. And the magicians did so with their enchantments, and brought up the frogs upon the land of Mitzrayim. Then Pharaoh called for Moshe and Aharon, and said, Entreat El Yahuwah, that he may take away the frogs from me, and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto Yahuwah. All right, so we know he's lying here. And Moshe said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when I shall entreat for you and for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from you and your houses that they may remain in the river only. And he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Be it according to your word, that you may know that there is none like unto Yahweh Lohenu. And the frogs shall depart from you and from your houses and from your servants and from your people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moshe and Aharon went out from Pharaoh, and Moshe cried unto El Yahuwah because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And Yahuwah did according to the word of Moshe, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart, and hearkened not unto them, as Yahuwah had said. Let's take a look at uh, Yashar 80, 6-9. And Yahweh sent again and caused all their waters to bring forth frogs, and all the frogs came into the house of all the Egyptians. And when the Egyptians drank, their bellies were filled with frogs, and they danced in their bellies as they danced in the river. And all their drinking water and cooking water turned to frogs. Also, when they lay in their beds, their perspiration bred frogs. Eesh. Notwithstanding all this, the anger of Yahweh did not turn from them, and his hand was stretched out against all the Egyptians to smite them with every heavy plague. Take a look at Revelation 16. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs out of all the animals it could have been frogs, right? Just like in, in Exodus. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the entire world to gather them together for the war of the great day of Elohim, the almighty El Shaddai. 
what's happened before is going to happen again. All right, so chapter 8, verse 16 through 19. Yahweh said unto El Moshe, Say unto El Aharon, Stretch out your rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Mitzrayim. Uh, praise Yah, I've never had lice before, but I've seen people that had it, and it's just like, yuck. Yuck. And they did so. For Ahron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast, and all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Mitzrayim. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there's a stopping point for what they can do. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of Elohim. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them, as Yahuwah had said. Now, never had lice, but... Um, what was it? 2015, when I moved, um, when we moved from Virginia to Springfield, Missouri, we were so broke. We were so poor that we rented a house for like 325 a month. It was literally like a one bedroom, like maybe 400 square foot house built in the 1800s. Old, old house. And I'm not complaining because it was a place, right? I'm just giving you the, the scenario here old house uh kind of a slum slum house and um anyways so there was a we moved in and there was like an infestation of fleas and it wasn't quite lice but there were so many fleas that like it was like literally biting us and it was daniel was just like a little infant at the time like maybe like six months and he was getting bite marks on him we're like ah <sighs> Man, that was uh, that was we had to obviously get rid of that. Um, uh, praise God, we did. But I can just imagine if that was fleas pestering us, I can only imagine what lice would be like. Like just uh, so, yeah. Anyways, uh, thankfully we only had to live there for like six months, I think, seven months. I don't know, but we got out of there. Praise God. <laughs> okay. Um, so I wanted to read, let's see, was there, yeah, so Yashar, so the, for the lice, Yashar 80, 10 through 12. And he sent and smote their dust to lice, and lice became in Egypt to the height of two cubits upon the earth. The lice were also very numerous in the flesh of man and beast, and all the inhabitants of Egypt, also upon the king and queen, Yahuwah sent lice, and it grieved Egypt exceedingly on account of the lice. Notwithstanding this, the anger of Yahuwah did not turn away, and his hand was still stretched out over Egypt. Okay, um, so now Exodus eight twenty through 32. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he comes forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus says Yahuwah, Let my people go. Sorry, in, growing up in Hebrew school, we sang this song all the time. It was like my favorite song. Let my people go. So I can't read that and not sing it. That they may serve me. Else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon you and upon your servants and upon your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Mitzrayim shall be full of the swarm of flies and also the ground whereon they are. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end that you may know that I am Yahuwah in the midst of the earth. And I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. And Yahuwah did so. And there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses and into all the land of Mitzrayim. The land was corrupted by the reason of the swarm of flies. And Pharaoh called for Moshe and Aharon and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your Elohim in the land. Right? So he's like, stay in, in Egypt and sacrifice. He's like, just stay here and just do it. And Moshe said, It is not meet so f to do, for we, sh for, sh for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Mitzrayim to Yahweh Lehenu. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Mitzrayim before their eyes, and will they not stone us? And <clears throat> most of you probably get this, but just in case you're, you're missing it here, um, the Egyptians worshipped animals, mainly cats, dogs, sheep, rams specifically, and cattle, in a certain type of crane, I forgot the ibis, I think. Anyway, so they literally worship them as like gods on the earth. That's why you see a lot of their statues. Ha statues uh, have like 
bird heads and, you know, people bodies and stuff like that. Anyways, so uh, the two main animals for sacrifice for Yahuwah is animals they worship. So they worship the, the sheep, um, probably the goat too, I imagine, um, and cattle. And so uh, Moses is like, uh, you know, the laws of Egypt and sorry, the laws of Egypt were if somebody killed one of those animals, they'd be put to death. Like literally, if you're like, hey, I want to eat this cow, I'm going to go ahead and just and eat it. You would literally get killed, stoned. So uh, Moses is like, uh, are we going to, you know, our sacrifices are the abominations of, of Egyptians. How can you say that we're going to sacrifice, you know, this cattle or the sheep? You know that we'll get stoned. That's also why, you know, when the children of Israel were in Egypt, or I'm sorry, in the wilderness, and Moses was gone for for some time, the very first thing they did was, like, well, let's let's do what we what we know. They lived in Egypt for, you know, a couple hundred years, and they saw all this, and so they're like, well, let's resort back to the only thing we know. Let's worship Yah through this golden calf, right? All right. Uh, verse 27, we will go three days journey. So Moses is like, we're not going to do it here. We're going to go three days journey in the wilderness and sacrifice to Yahweh he knew as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to Yahweh Elohaika in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. And Moshe said, behold, I go out from you and I will entreat El Yahweh that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully anymore in not letting the people go to sacrifice Yahweh. And Moshe went out from Pharaoh and entreated Yahuwah. Yahuwah did according to the word of Moshe, and he removed the swarm of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. Let's take a look at Yashar 80, 13 through 23. And Yahuwah sent all kinds of beasts into the field of Egypt, and they came and destroyed all Egypt, man and beasts and trees and all things that were in Egypt. And then Yahuwah sent fiery serpents, scorpions, mice, weasels, toads, together with other creeping in the dust. And this is interesting because this is what happens in Revelation. Um, it's the, the four sore judgments we see in Ezekiel that correlates to um, the judgments we see in Revelation that uh, by sword, famine, and beasts of the earth and... Pestilence? Yeah. And um, so beasts of the field like, literally come and start like attacking people. That's what we see in Ezekiel, the four sore judgments. And Yahweh sent fiery serpents, scorpions, mice, weasels, toes, together with other creeping in the dust, flies, hornets, fleas, bugs, and gnats, each swarm according to its kind. And all reptiles and winged animals according to their kind came to Egypt and grieved the Egyptians exceedingly. And the fleas and flies came into the eyes and ears of the Egyptians. Ah! And the hornet came upon them to dr and drove them away, and they removed it into their inner rooms, and, pursu and it pursued them. And when the Egyptians hid themselves on account of the swarms of animals, they locked their doors after them. And Elohim ordered the Sulanuth, which is like a water creature, which was in the sea, to come up and to go into Egypt. And she had long arms, ten cubits in length, of the cubit of man. And she went upon the roofs and uncovered the raftering and flooring and cut them and stretched forth her arm to the house and removed the lock and a bolt and opened the houses of Egypt. And afterward came the swarm of animals into the houses of Egypt and the swarms of animals destroyed the Egyptians and aggrieved them exceedingly. Notwithstanding this, the anger of Yahuwah did not turn away from the Egyptians and his hand was stretched forth against them. Whew, rough times. Rough day, huh? All right, how many of us want to be on the right side of things when this happens in the last days, even worse fashion, right? All right, last chapter, chapter 9, uh, verse 1 through 7. Then Yahweh said unto El Moshe, Go unto Pharaoh and tell, the, tell him, Thus says Yahweh of the Ibrim, the Hebrews, Let, let my people go, Sorry, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go, and will hold them still, behold, the hand of Yahuwah is upon your cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous pestilence. And Yahuwah shall sever between the cattle of Yashrael and the cattle of the Mitzrayim, and there shall nothing die of all that is the children of Yashrael. And Yahuwah appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow Yahuwah shall do this thing in the land. And Yahuwah did the thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of the Mitzrayim died. But of the cattle of the children of Yashrael died not one. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of Yashrael dead. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. 
All right, so let's take a look at, uh, well, it's interesting, uh, I want to preface this, when it says this Hebrew word cattle here, let's take a look at it. The <clears throat> uh, word is mikne, which can be translated as cattle or possession or flocks, substance, herds. So cattle, livestock, uh, in general, a purchase of a domestic animal, cows, sheep, goats, and herds and flocks, right? So it doesn't have to necessarily just be cows. Just wanted to preface that before we read Yashar. Um, Yashar 80, 24 through 26. And Elohim sent the pestilence, and the pestilence pervaded Egypt in the horses and asses and the camels and the herds of oxen and sheep and in man. And when the, the Egyptians rose up early in the morning to take their cattle to pasture, they all found their cattle dead. And there remained of the cattle of the Egyptians only one in ten, and of the cattle belonging to Israel and Goshen, not one died. And Elohim sent a... Oh, actually, yeah, we'll stop there. Okay. Uh, we're also going to take a look at the Targums. I haven't read here for a while, so let's go to chapter 9. There wasn't anything to read, I guess, in 8. So chapter 9, verse 7. And Pharaoh sent certain to look, and behold, not one of the cattle of the sons of Israel had died, not even one. But the disposition of Pharaoh's heart was aggravated, and he would not release the people. So it's a little interesting, different perspective. All right, let's look a look at uh, Exodus 9, 8 through 12. And Yahweh said unto El Moshe and unto El Aharon, Take you handfuls of ashes of the furnace and let Moshe sprinkle it toward the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh. And it shall become small dust in the land of Mitzrayim and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man. Some translations say tumors and upon beasts throughout all the land of Mitzrayim. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh and Moshe, Moshe sprinkled it up toward the heavens and it became a boil bringing forth with blains upon man or tumor upon and upon beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moshe because of the boils for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Mitzrayim. And Yahuwah hardened the heart of Pharaoh and he hearkened not unto them as Yahuwah had spoken unto El Moshe. Let's take a look at uh, Yashar 27 through 29. And Elohim sent a burning inflammation in the flesh of the Egyptians, which burst their skins, and it became a severe itch in all the Egyptians, from the soles of their feet into the crowns of their heads. This reminds me when I had chicken pox. And many boils were in their flesh, that their flesh wasted away until they became rotten and putrid. Notwithstanding this, the anger of Yahuwah did not turn away, and his hand was stretched out over all Egypt. So there's some interesting parallels here with this burning inflammation, this um, this boil, this tumor. Um, reminding me of something I read in, in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy fifteen uh, twenty eight fifteen. But it shall come to about. So Deuteronomy twenty eight one through fourteen was all the blessings for keeping Torah. Deuteronomy fifteen, but it shall come about if you do not obey Yahweh your Elohim to be careful to follow all His commandments and His statutes, which I am commanding you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So remember. Pharaoh and all of Egypt are being, are being um, destroyed with all these plagues because they're not obeying Yahuwah through Moses. And then skipping down verses 21 through 22, Yahuwah will make the plague cling to you until he has eliminated you from the land when you are entering to take possession of it. Yahuwah will strike you with consumption, inflammation. Consumption is like a sickness, like a, um, <clears throat> actually like a respiratory sickness. Uh, let's just take a look at that here. A, a consumption, a wasting disease of the lungs. Kind of interesting with what's going on right now. Yahuwah will strike you with consumption, inflammation, fever, feverish heat, and with a sword, with blight, and with mildew, and they will, pers they will pursue you until you perish. And then down in verse 27, Yahuwah will strike you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors and the festering rash and with scabies from which you cannot be healed. So these are just uh, some of the... Uh, um, punishments for not obeying Yahweh's Torah. Likewise, what we see, the punishment for um, Egypt for not obeying Moshe, you know, Yahweh through Moshe. Take a look at Revelation. Revelation 6, 2 and 11. So, <clears throat> one thing we see in Egypt, Pharaoh, is seeing sign after sign. Like, how many signs do you need to like hearken unto the Elohim of heaven? 
Revelation 6, 2. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and a harmful and painful sore afflicted the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Similar stuff as, as uh, Exodus. Uh, verse 11. And they blasphemed the Elohim of heaven because of their pain and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Man, it's like, how much do you need to see people? They did not repent. We see something similar in Yashar chapter 2, verses 3 through 9 in Noah's day. Um, or not even Noah's day, but even before. And it was in the days of Enosh that the sons of men continued to rebel and transgress against Elohim to increase the anger of Yahuwah against the sons of men. And the sons of men went and they served other Elohim and they forgot Yahuwah who had created them in the earth. And in those days, the sons of men made images of brass and iron, wood and stone, and they bowed down and served them. And every man made his Elohim and they bowed down to them. And the sons of men forsook Yahuwah all the days of Enosh and his children. And the anger of Yahuwah was kindled on account of their works and abominations which they did in the earth. And Yahweh caused the waters of the river Gihon to overwhelm them, and he destroyed and consumed them, and he destro destroyed the third part of the earth. And notwithstanding this, the sons of men did not turn from their evil ways, and their hands were yet extended to do evil in the sight of Yahweh. And in those days there was neither sowing nor reaping in the earth, and there was no food for the sons of men, and the famine was very great in those days. And the seed which they sowed in those days in the ground became thorns, thistles, and briars. For from the days of Adam was this declaration concerning the earth of the curse of Elohim, which he cursed the earth on account of the sin which Adam sinned before Yahuwah. And it was when men continued to rebel and transgress against Elohim and to corrupt their ways that the earth also became corrupt. So it's like even with all these signs, they still would not listen. Yeshar chapter 6, 11 and 12 and on that day, Yahweh caused the whole earth to shake, and the sun darkened, and the foundations of the world raged, and the whole earth was moved violently, and the lightning flashed, and the thunder roared, and all the fountains in the earth were broken up, such as it was not known to the inhabitants before. And Elohim did this mighty act in order to terrify the sons of men, that there might be no more evil upon the earth. And still the sons of men would not return from their evil ways. And they increased the anger of Yahuwah at that time and did not even direct their hearts to all this. Just like what we saw in Revelation 16. They blasphemed the Elohim of heaven because of their pain and their sores and they did not repent of their deeds. They, they remained hardened in their hearts like Pharaoh. So it's just gonna, like there's going to be like millions or even billions of Pharaoh, little Pharaohs running around this earth when all these things go down. It's a shame. All right, so now we're going to read uh, Exodus 9, 13. We're going to finish up, and then we have a few parallel passages to read. And Yahweh said unto El Moshe, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus says Yahweh Elohai of the Ibrim, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon your heart and upon your servants and upon your people, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may smite you and your people with pestilence, and you shall be cut off from the earth. And in very deed for this cause have I raised you up, for to show you in you my power, that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. As yet exalt you yourself against my people, that you will not let them go? Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as it has not been in Mitzrayim since the foundation thereof even until now. And we're going to see a little bit later in this great tribulation, it's going to be even worse. Send therefore now and gather your cattle and all that you have in the field. So he's giving him a warning. He's like, I'm getting ready to do this. For upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them and they shall die. He that feared the word of Yahuwah among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. Who's the word of Yahuwah? So it says he who basically listened they put their cattle and their servants inside. And he that regarded not the word of Yahuwah left his servants and his cattle in the field. And Yahuwah said unto El Moshe, Stretch forth your hand toward the heavens, that there may be hail in all the land of Mitzrayim, upon man and upon beast and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Mitzrayim. And Moshe stretched forth his rod toward the heavens, and Yahuwah sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along upon the ground, and Yahuwah rained hail upon the land of Mitzrayim. So there was hail, and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Mitzrayim, since it became a nation. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Mitzrayim, and all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smote every herb of the field, and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Yashael were, was there no hail. 
And Pharaoh sent and called for Moshe and Aharon and said unto them, I have sinned this time. Yahuwah is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Entreat El Yahuwah, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. And Moshe said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto El Yahuwah, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that you may know how that the earth is Yahuwah's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you will not fear Yahuwah Elohim. And the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax was bold. That means that the <clears throat> the fl the flowers were already uh, fallen off, and um, it was starting to the actual fruit was starting to bud. But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. And a lot of people actually ask actually ask me what's going on here. Um, flax and barley, or barley specifically, is a first fruits crop. That's a crop that's harvested in early spring. That's why it was the first uh, first fruits wave offering. Um, the wheat is a late spring, early summer crop. And that's why in the Feast of Pentecost, you have uh, centered around the, the wheat harvest. And of course, the grapes is a um, late summer, early fall crop. And that's why you have the fall feast of Sh um, Sukkot, which is centered around the grape harvest. So the three main harvests of Israel was barley, wheat, and grapes. Those are your three main feast days. Passover will pass over unleavened bread and first fruits, then Shavuot, then Sukkot. All right, verse, uh, yeah, but for the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. And Moshe went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread abroad his hands in the El Yahuwah, and the thunders and hail ceased, and the rain was not poured upon the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, neither would he let the children of Yahshua go as Yahuwah had spoken by Moshe. So, end of the Torah portion, but we got a, a couple of things to um, parallel here. We're going to go to Yashar 80. Uh, oh, we forgot to read about the boils. Did we read about the boils? No, yeah, we did. We did. Okay. So, at 30 through 32. And Yahuwah sent a very heavy hail, which smote their vines and broke their fruit trees and dried them up that they fell upon them. Also, every green herb became dry and perished, for a mingling fire descended amidst the hail. Therefore, the hail and the fire consumed all things. Also, men and beasts that were found abroad perished of the flames of fire and of the hail, and all the young lions were exhausted. That's a really interesting passage for another time. Um, Revelation parallel. Lots of hail and thunder in this, in this book. Revelation 8, 5 through 7, Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and hurled it to the earth. And there were peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. The first sounded, and there was hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled to the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all of the green grass was burned up. And then 19 through 21, the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon, the great was remembered in the sight of Elohim to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath and every island fled and no mountains were found and huge hailstones weighing about a talent each came down from heaven upon people and people blasphemed Elohim because of the plague of the hail because the hailstone plague was extremely severe. Verse uh, and, and what's interesting here is these people had no excuse because they were warned. This is, this is Revelation 16. And Revelation 14, we see here, see great Babylon's falling first, and then the hailstones, they were warned. Revelation 14, 6 through 13. And I saw another angel flying in mid heaven with an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said with a loud voice, voice, fear Elohim and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. And another angel, a second one, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Then another angel, a third one, will follow them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast on his image and receives a mark in his forehead or in his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of Elohim, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. Isn't that this hail that's getting ready to come down? 
and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name, here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of Elohim and their faith in Yahusha. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in Yahuwah from now on. This is a tribulation saints. People that say, No, and maybe I messed up before, but I ain't do it anymore. I'm going to stand up for the commandments of the Most High, and I'll die for my faith right now. Blessed are the dead because the righteous, the, the wise virgins, were already taken out. The foolish virgins, are still his people, had to go through it and had to get destroyed because they were not ready at, the, at his coming. Right. Blessed are the dead who die in Yahuwah from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors and their deeds follow with them. Hallelujah. Now let's take a look at the Targums. Uh, 9, 20 through 21. <clears throat> uh, oh, here, here. All right, but verse 19. But now send and gather together thy flocks and all that you have in your field for upon all men and cattle that are found on the field and not gathered together within your house will the hail come down and they will die. So they were warned ahead of time about the fire and brimstone or hail that was coming down. Get ready to come down. Hey, if you just simply put people in your houses, they'll be all right. And they didn't listen. Verse 20, And Hebob, or Job, who reverenced the word of Yahuwah among the servants of Pharaoh, gathered together his servants and his flocks within his house. But Balaam, who did not set his heart upon the word of Yahuwah, left his servants and his flocks in the field. Kind of interesting, right? Now, to finish this up, um, I want to read this. I might read this this week and next week. We look at Second Baruch 27. We see some end time stuff. Hebrew 27. Wow, I went so fast. Okay. We see some similar things. It's not exact, but similar things. Second Baruch 27. And he answered and said to me, into 12 parts is that time divided, and each one of them is reserved for that which is appointed for it. In the first part, there should be the beginning of commotions, kind of like Messiah says, wars and rumors of wars. In the second part, there should be slangs of the great ones. In the third part, the fall of many by death. The fourth part, the sending of the sword. In the fifth part, famine and withholding of rain. The sixth part, earthquakes and terrors. Part 7 is wanting. That means it was missing from the text. And the eighth part, a multitude of specters and attacks of Shadim, devils. And the ninth part, the fall of fire. And the tenth part, rapine and much oppression. And then the eleventh part, wickedness and unchastity. And in the twelfth part, confusion from the mingling together of all those things aforesaid. For these parts of that time are reserved and shall be mingled one with the other and minister one to another. For some shall leave out some of their own and receive in its stead from others, and some shall complete their own and that of others so that those may not understand who are upon the earth in those days that it is the consummation of the times. That's why people are still blaspheming Elohim because they're like, you know, they're probably being told on earth that, hey, it's uh, sea change, uh, weather changing, you know, uh, climate stuff. Like ah, That's why this is all happening. It's our own fault. And people are probably saying like, GD, you know, just a guess. I don't know. Apocalypse of Abraham. Phenomenal read. We're going to read chapter 30 through 31. Oh, I just want to read this whole book to you right now. It's not a long read. Maybe a 45 minute read. 35, 40, 45 minute read. Okay. We're going to read on this left side here. The two different texts. There's a um, Syriac text and another one. Anyways, I just like this one better. We're in chapter 30 and 31. And while he was still speaking, I found myself on the earth, and I said, Eternal Mighty One, I am no longer in the glory in which I was above, and all that my soul desires to understand in my heart I do not understand. And he said to me, I will explain to you the things that you desired in your heart. For you have sought to know the ten plagues which I prepared against the heathen, and I prepared them beforehand in the passing of the twelve hours on earth. Hear what I will tell you. It will be thus. First, the sorrow for much need. The second, fiery conflagrations for the cities. The third, destruction by pestilence among the cattle. The fourth, famine of the world and their generation. The fifth, among the rulers, destruction by earthquake and the sword. The sixth, the increase of hail and snow. Sounds a lot like climate sea, you know. The seventh, wild beasts will be their grave. The eighth, pestilence and hunger will change their destruction. The ninth, execution by sword and flight and distress. The tenth, thunder, voices, and destroying earthquakes. Sounds like Revelation, right? 
chapter 31, then I will sound the trumpet out of the air and I will send my chosen one, having him in one measure of all my power and he will summon all my people. Humiliated by the heathen, and I will burn with fire those who mocked them and ruled over them in this age, and I will deliver those who have covered me with mockery over to the scorn of the coming age, because I have prepared them to be food for the fire of Hades, and to be ceaseless soaring in the air of the underworld to the uttermost depths, to be the contents of a wormy belly. For the makers will see them in justice, the makers who have chosen my desire and manifestly kept my commandments, and they will rejoice with Mary making over the downfall of the men who remain and who followed after the idols, after their murders, for they shall putrefy in the belly of the crafty worm Azazel, and be burned by the fire of Azazel's tongue. For I waited so they, I'm, so they might come to me, and they did not deign to, and they glorified an alien Elohim. And they joined one to whom they had not been allotted, and they abandoned Yahuwah, who gave them strength. Anyways, just interesting stuff. And so with this is the uh, end of the Torah portion. So uh, I pray it was a blessing to you. Um, any wisdom that may have been found in here uh, was obviously uh, because the Most High is releasing wisdom in these last days. Praise be to him who is the giver of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, it's something that I think we should continue to ask him for every day. The book of James says, uh, ask for wisdom and it shall be given to you, except if you're double-minded. So don't be double-minded about him and keeping his ways. Praise be to Messiah Yahusha, our king, our great teacher, who has uh, left his amazing teachings for us of how to walk as he walked, which is to walk in spirit and in truth, right? The, the keeping of the commandments and the fruit of the spirit doing so in the fruit of the spirit having fervent love for one another fervent charity for one another taking care of each other not uh having dissension and um bickerings amongst each other and tearing down and just all kinds of stuff divisions and all kinds of stuff so just keep that in mind and stay humble stay meek brothers and sisters psalm 25 9 says he guides the meek in judgment and he teaches the meek or the humble in his way let's stay humble constantly let's pray let's bow our hearts heavenly father yahuwah most high we come before you bless you and praise you in yahusha's name thank you father for allowing us to study like this in these last days we pray that you protect the ministry and this platform that we can uh we can share uh, the word together and, and learn together until that very last moment, Father. Uh, we ask you to continue to bless all of us who are seeking you with a true heart. Um, we just want to pray um, that you keep us in health and, and in your favor, Father. And uh, most of all, we pray that you keep us uh, in the narrow path, Father, for we do not want to go to the left or the right of it. We bless you and thank you in Yahushua's mighty name. Amen and hallelujah. A um, couple announcements. Stick around for a second. For those of you that are interested in um, the Passover we're doing in April, uh, we're doing it uh, April 15th. Check in in the morning through the 24th um, in Lebanon, Missouri, same place we did Sukkot. Uh, we'd love for you to join us. Uh, we're going to have room for up to 700 people. So uh, I think we're somewhere around 300 now, so we got plenty of room. So if you want to join us and... Um, if you want more information, it'll be in the description box below. And um, yeah, so with that, um, a couple songs I want to play. Uh, the first song I want to play is going to be um, the song of Sukkot. So if you want to get a little bit of uh, an idea how, how much fun Sukkot was, it was literally the best 10 days of my life ever, hands down. Um, and... Um, you know, we're basically doing it all over again for Pesach. We're going to be camping out for eight days. And then I want to do the song of Moshe. Because if you're coming, you're going to want to know this song. Because we sing it every night together as a group. So it's a lot more fun when you know the words and you can sing it. So start memorizing it now. Blessings to you, brothers and sisters. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Shabbat.
I sing to Yahuwah, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Yah is my strength and song, and he has become my deliverance. He is my El and I praise him, Elohim of my Father. And I exalt him. Yahuwah is a man of battle, Yahuwah is his name. He has cast Pharaoh's chariots and his army into the sea. And his chosen officers are drowned in the sea of reeds. The depths covered them. They went down to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah, has become great in power. Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah, has crushed the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you pulled down those who rose up against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the wind of your nostrils, the waters were heaped up. The floods stood like a wall, the depths became stiff. In the heart of the sea, the enemy said, I pursue, I overtake, I divide the spoil. My being is satisfied on them. I draw out my sword, my hand destroys them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you? Yahuwah among the mighty ones Who is like you, great in Kodesha Awesome in praises, working wonders You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them In your kindness, you led the people whom you have redeemed in your strength, you guided them to your Kodesh dwelling. Peoples heard, they trembled. Anguish gripped the inhabitants of Pelasheth. Then the chiefs of Edom were troubled, the mighty men of Moab. Trembling grips them, all the inhabitants of Canaan. Melted, fear and dread fell on them by the greatness of your arm. They are as silent as a stone. Until your people pass over, O oh, Yahuwah. Until the people whom you have bought pass over. You bring them in and plant them In the mountain of your inheritance In the place, O oh, Yahuwah Which you have made for your own dwelling The meek dash, O oh, Yahuwah Which your hands have prepared Yahuwah reigns forever and ever